In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The epistle we heard today was a pastoral letter. It was from the Apostle Peter. It was his first pastoral letter to the Christian church. And if I could write any letter to my parishioners as a pastor, this would probably be the letter I would write. Peter says, All of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Then Peter quotes from the Old Testament. He says, For he who would love life and see good days, let us refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you. What an incredible letter from the heart of a pastor. Our first pastor, St. Peter, writing to the Christian church, asking them to put on that genuine love and compassion of brothers and sisters. Of course, that epistle today is only accented by the words of Christ in the gospel. They should make us tremble a little. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees, their righteousness was quite well known. The way they observed the law, the way they were seen in the temple, the way they were seen at prayer on the street corners, the way they followed every little bit of the law. They knew everything there was to know about the temple. They knew everything there was to know about the, the Torah and they were well respected. And so yet Jesus is giving us something more. He says, unless your, your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It was not, you might not, it's, it's, it's a definite, you, you won't. And because Jesus is not looking for the righteousness of appearance or the righteousness of practice, but he's looking at the righteousness of the heart. The Apostle James, another great, he says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love the God whom he has not seen. My dear friends, these words are serious. They are serious for us as Christians because it reminds us that we too could fall into the same trap of the scribes and Pharisees in our Lord's day. How much he came and how he was grieved at the hardness of heart of the Pharisees. So Jesus left with sadness the temple, left with sadness those who knew the gospel, those who knew what the practice was, those who lived it in every way. He left the temple and where did he go? He went to the streets and found Matthew, who wrote the gospel today. He found Mary Magdalene. He found prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners. He found those who were seeking God in their hearts, who knew that they needed to be saved. Yes, my dear friends, we must not ever think that we here at Cantus are the saved or the chosen or that somehow because our practice of the law, our observance of the rubrics, our attendance at the Latin Mass, our ability to know the prayers, our ability to know the catechism will save us because that will not save you. It is rather your love of your neighbor, your love of your neighbor. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's easy to think that when we're here at such a beautiful parish, it is a beautiful parish, and such a beautiful mass, and it really is a glorious mass, but it's easy to think that because we do these things, 
and maybe some of us even go to confession weekly, but it's easy for us to think that somehow we are justified, that that saves us. But it doesn't. How often when we hear a sermon at this church, we hear examples of the gospel, we hear a condemnation of sinners, and the first person we think about is others around us and not ourselves. When we hear our Lord speak of sinners, we think about, oh yeah, I saw that person, or the people we saw outside the the church. Mm, My dear friends, the only litmus test is how well we love our brothers and sisters. Yes, man sees the appearance, but only God sees the heart. We are all guilty of this. We're guilty of making a judgment. We're all guilty of shouting, you fool, at our brother or sister. We do this. We make judgments so many times a day, and that's a natural part. But the standard is higher The standard is higher because Jesus asks us not to live there, but to live in the place of radical love. When we hear about sinners, the first person we should think about is ourselves, our need for redemption. In our parish, may we never, ever have a critical spirit. May there never, ever be a judgmental spirit in our parish. When the Apostle Peter says, be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is within you, how many of us, when we are outside this parish, people come to us and say, well, I want to know what what faith you practice. I want to know what your church is because you are so loving. I want to know where you go to Mass because you have so much hope. And we are ready to give an explanation that we know the hope that comes from Jesus Christ in spite of the ridiculousness of the world. No, my dear friends, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. St. Thomas Aquinas asserts that whenever we see something that's suspicious, or whenever we see somebody who maybe is not practicing the law of God, our first moral obligation is to assume the best intention. To assume that this person has the best intention, to give them the highest benefit of the doubt. That is our moral obligation as Christians. But how often we jump to a conclusion and assume that maybe the person who's coming to this church, maybe a little underdressed, is a visitor who's first time here, or somebody who acts strangely, or somebody, some visitor who comes, and yet by our looks or our scowls, they will never ever return here to experience the love of God. What a scandal. What a scandal. The love of Jesus must be more radical than what we are practicing here because his love is radical because at this altar, he gives himself in total self-gift out of love for you. Our whole Christian life has to be a response. It is when we understand the gaze of Christ in our sinfulness that we know his love and are able to give it to others. We all have a history. Each one of us, in our secrets, we know well the ugly matters of our own personal history. We all hide some skeletons. But the gaze of Christ looks beyond that to each of you. But we sometimes are not capable of that same gaze. We look at the ugly matters of others. We fall into chattering, gossiping, spill of speaking ill of others. But Jesus, on the contrary, looks past that. He looks past the wounds and mistakes, goes beyond sins and prejudices. He does not stop at the appearance, but Jesus reaches the heart. My dear friends, you must come to see that it is possible for us to be self-centered in our self-denial and self-righteous in our self-sacrifice. We can be generous in order to feed our own ego, and we can be pious in order to feed our pride. We unfortunately 
have the tragic capacity to relegate a heightening virtue to a tragic vice. Yeah, we need help. We need help from our Lord Jesus. But my dear friends, that help is available. This month as we finish the month of the Sacred Heart, Jesus told us, learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. We learn from our Savior who always counters the ingratitude, the rejection of men with a burning heart full of love, who doesn't hide his heart but holds his heart open, ready to be pierced again for our salvation. My dear friends, that has to be the standard of our Christian life. If we find ourselves guilty of a critical spirit, guilty of judgment, guilty of gossip, guilty of untruth, guilty of lack of charity, come to that storehouse of grace, the heart of Jesus pierced for us. He's willing to give you that grace. Let us repent and humble ourselves before his heart, seeking only that meekness and love that he gives, that dear rest. My dear friends, it is my hope that our parish becomes known for its radical love, not just the worship of God, which is primary and foremost, but it must translate into a deep and abiding love for our brothers and sisters. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.